Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I'm already in trouble in Penge for something I said last week. I've probably just alienated half of Slough, but we will explain why Slough is in the firing line today when our attention turns later in the programme to Sadiq Khan's uh, unprecedented inquiry into foreign property ownership in the capital. It is, a, of course, a, a phenomenon that's unfolding right across the country as well. After that, I'm looking at this story from... Well, I looked at it this morning, this story from Iran about female chess players um, having to wear headscarves in order to um, attend the World Championship in Iran and I was thinking how can we talk about that it's just another invitation to mug off a Muslim isn't it there's one in the papers every day and I looked up from the newspaper and saw Shimon Perez's funeral on the television screen where's he going with this you're thinking right and every man there Tony Blair Bill Clinton Barack Obama is wearing a yamulka a head covering as a religious requirement in order to attend an event and I, I, it may well be that this is one of those thoughts that loses its power the more I examine it, but right now, box fresh, what's the difference? What's the difference? Could you imagine a British politician saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to Shimon Peres' funeral because they're going to make me wear a hat, or a head covering, or a scarf, or whatever it may be. We'll get onto that later in the programme. It, it could be fertile, that, don't you think? And it's a nice, neat swerve of that, what you're supposed to do with these stories when the newspapers print them is just use them as a soft invitation to mug off a Muslim. You know, there's a story like that every day. You know there is. There's probably one elsewhere in the papers. So we'll resist that temptation, as we always do, and turn our attention first to poverty. I have no idea how to conduct this conversation. I have no idea at all. I, I literally don't know where to start. I, I don't know how to ask a question that doesn't alienate or patronise you. I don't know how to conduct a conversation in a way that makes me sound informed or knowledgeable. You often um, get accused of, of, of living in a bubble, don't you, if you uh, hold views that are thoughtful rather than populist. And it, it's sometimes true, actually. I mean, you know, we all live in bubbles in a way. I, I don't know what it's like to live, for example, in, in, the, 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 in the sticks, in the middle of the countryside. Maybe my world outlook would be different if I did. I don't know what it's like to be extremely rich. Maybe my world outlook would be different if I did. I don't know what it's like to be extremely extremely poor. Maybe my world outlook would be different if I did, but I certainly didn't know. I, 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 I honestly didn't know that this issue was so stark. More than 16 million people, 16 million people in the UK have savings of less than £100. This is a study by the Money Advice Service. In five areas of the country, Northern Ireland, West Midlands, Yorkshire, um, and Humber, I hate that, Yorkshire and Humber, North East England and Wales, five areas of this country, more than half the adult population has savings below that level. I have never said anything to you in all the years we've spent together more important than this, and yet it will be reaching some people's ears as a statement of the bleeding obvious. It will be reaching 16 million people's ears, potentially. Actually, my audience isn't quite that big. It will be reaching a significant number of people's ears right now as a statement of the bleeding obvious. I am truly flabbergasted. You know how sometimes we talk, don't we, about the, um, about the way in which stories affect us and, and about the way in which we react to stuff. And sometimes problems are too huge to contemplate when we find ourselves looking at something absolutely enormous. Absolutely enormous. We almost prefer... It's like the banking crisis compared to the bloke over the road who's ripping off the benefits. We, we can't get cross about them. It's just too big to contemplate. I don't really understand... Bloke over there ripping off of the benefits. Oh, yes, furious. You take up cudgels against him. So some, some problems are too epic to properly process. And that's where I am this morning. I, I can't believe this story. I can't believe it's not the front page of every newspaper in the country. I can't believe it's not leading every bulletin on every television station and every radio station. I can't believe it's not leading to, 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 to marches in the street and protests against the status quo. I can't believe it's not at the top of the list of things that people care about in this country. What is at the top of that list? Yeah, in me blinking gration. So while we're all moaning about immigration, we've been rendered a country where 16 million people have savings of less than £100. Why? Well, you work it out. When's the last time you got a pay rise? When's the last time you got looked after financially? When's the last time you got 
actually <laughs> credited rather than debited in life. And, and I think part of the problem now is middle class, relatively well off journalists like me don't know how to handle these conversations because I do poverty porn. I uh, apologise for that phrase. Uh, I, I didn't realise I was guilty of it at the time, but there is a slight sensational flavour to some of the coverage that middle class, uh, uh, you know, bien pensant people who think that they're trying to make the world a better place. We, we pat ourselves on the back sometimes when we find someone really, really poor and go, oh, isn't this awful? This person is so poor. It doesn't really help. In the great scheme of things, our most obvious example of that was a lad in New Cross a couple of years ago who was, who was I mean, he was, he was starving, practically. He had nothing in his cupboards and no money coming. I think it was a conversation about food banks that uh, uh, led to that conversation. And he called in, and the phone call was so powerful and so moving, it, made, it actually made news headlines around the world. And, and he, he stopped actually wanting to contribute any further to the program after a neighbour of his showed him that he was in the Times of India. So a story about poverty in New Cross made the Times of India. But why did it? When right here, right now, we know that 16 million people have less than £100 stashed away. Less than £100. How am I sounding to you now? Uh, am I sounding out of touch? Am I sounding stupid? Am I sounding naive? Well, how am I sounding now? Can I even have this conversation with you? This seems to me to be the population or the constituency of this country that is absolutely and routinely ignored by all commentary, all journalism and all coverage. Because you're either needy or greedy in Britain at the moment. And this isn't about aspirational people who want to have a fair crack of the whip. This is about people who are literally on a hamster wheel and can see no way of getting off it. And it's not just the bottom 1% or the bottom 2%. Five areas of this country where more than half the adult population has less than a hundred pounds in the bank. A hundred pounds. A figure that some of my friends in the media who like to roundly condemn the, even the suggestion that there's inequality and, and unfairness in our shores would not even spend on lunch. They'd spend more than that per head on lunch. The people writing the newspaper columns telling you that there's no poverty in this country, the people saying that all the problems are the faults and the cause of immigrants, they're all spending more on lunch today than 16 million adults have in this world. I won't be spending more than £100 on lunch today because I'll be on a train. But I, but I could have done. I, I, I'm in that category of people who can do it. Is that why we don't talk about it? Because it could just turn into, well, why don't you give them all your money then? So you see, like they do on everything that involves trying to make the world a better place. Refugees, well, why don't you put them in your bedroom then? Beggars, well, why don't you put them in your bedroom then? Talking about poverty, well, why don't you give them all your money then? Tax, I think we should have higher tax. Well, why don't you pay it voluntarily then? And I have a horrible feeling... I've got to choose my words carefully now. I have a horrible feeling that those attitudes I've just described to you are probably quite prevalent among those 16 million people. That's the mystery of modern life, isn't it? That's the mystery of modern politics. These people are not only reduced to such straitened circumstances, but they're also buying into the right-wing rhetoric that anyone who suggests they shouldn't be in such straitened circumstances is a do-gooding lefty. Man alive, we've made a mess of things. And you know what's going to happen generations down the line? It turns out today, if you're born in the 80s, you're already considerably worse off than anyone born in the 70s. 30 years down the line, when children ask their parents, how the hell did you let this happen? How did you let this happen, Dad? How did you allow politicians to ride so roughshod over ordinary people while picking the pockets of the workers? And, and Dad will have to say, I'm really sorry, son. I, 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 they, they told me it was all the immigrants. All we talked about was immigrants. We blamed everything on immigrants. Like, what do you mean you blamed everything on immigrants? There's houses rotting in Hampstead owned by foreign billionaires. Rotting because they make more money out of owning it and just leaving it to go to seed. There's trees growing out the blinking roof. And you, and you didn't have £100 in the bank. And when they asked you whose fault you thought it was, did you really say immigrants, Dad? I, I did, son. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, and I voted to leave the European Union as well, so I'm, I'm sorry about that as well. It's quite incredible, this. Isn't this... Isn't, I mean, what, what, what is wrong with me today? Why am I surprised by this? 
A hundred pounds. Less than a hundred pounds. Now, you know what I'm going to do. I I'm going to ask you to call me. We'll call you straight back. I mean, Christ, does that sound patronising? How, how do you have this conversation? I truly don't know. I've got nothing today. I, I, I couldn't... I, I, I couldn't begin to imagine what it would be. I wake up in the middle of the night worried about money. You do as well, right? What am I worried about? I, I can't tell you. I'm too embarrassed. What am I worried about? And then there's another story about what the so-called middle classes would do if they found themselves in need of an unexpected £500. A bill to pay. A, five, a mate of mine, his moped, got knocked up outside his own flat. And that, that puts him back. That doesn't just sort of go, oh, crikey, I'll have to do that. It means he has to dip into a legacy in order just to replace his wheels, just to get to work, where he earns a decent whack, but he lives in the southeast. I don't know what to do today. I don't know how to conduct this conversation. I honestly don't. How do I have this convo? Oh, it's all right for you, James. Yeah, I know. But I don't want to live in a country like this where not only are people, 16 million people, with less than £100 in the bank, and still, what's on the front page of the Daily Mail? Some bishop banging on about bloody migrants every flipping day. How would you live with less than £100? How, how do you get through the day? What's your life like compared to the people telling you to blame all your problems on immigration? 16 million pounds. People with less than a hundred pounds. How did you let this happen, Dad? Sorry, son. I blamed it all on Romanians and Muslims. Selling your birthright down the river, turning our country into a client state, sucking up to Russian oligarchs whose money couldn't be filthier. That's what the politicians were doing. What were you doing, Dad? I was shouting at Muslims, son. I was getting cross about mosques. Why, Dad? Well, that's what the newspapers told me to do. That's what some of these politicians told me to do. I even heard some of them on LBC. They've got their own shows. What? what? You had less than £100 in the bank while the richest people in the land were, were commissioning yachts like it was going out of fashion and you honestly thought your problems were caused by the European Union. Freedom of movement laws. Yeah, I did, son, yeah. I'm really sorry. It's a bit late now, Dad. It's 10.15. And it's not the existence of such poverty that staggers me this morning, it's the quantity, the scale. Five areas of this country where more than half of the adult population has savings of less than £100. If you'd really pushed me on this, I'd have said maybe about, about 10%, maybe maximum 10%, less than £100. And most of them will be working, and it's about what you've got left at the end of the month. But everybody who writes about politics, everybody who talks about politics, everybody who is in the business of disseminating opinion or information is a billion miles away from that world. It's a, it's a country divided in a way I, I, I just did not grasp. Well, I'm grasping it now. Robert's in Rochester. Robert, what can you tell us? Hello there. Well, I actually want to be a politician, but that's a whole other story. The ability to actually become a politician is kind of out of my um, length. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Well, let, let's just... That, um, that's two other stories. Let's concentrate on the one we're discussing, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, for the last seven years, I've been kind of um, in that same situation. When the insurance bill comes in, I'm uh, struggling to even manage to, so therefore I have to go a couple of days without insurance just to make sure I can cover it or whatever. But it's just kind of where... The work situation um, where unskilled labour has been cut back and cut back and cut back. There's not 16 um, million unskilled labourers in this country, is there? And this is this is the yeah. point I'm trying to address today: is the fact that that we we, we can all pick our favourite examples of, of of where people aren't getting paid enough. But this is more than half the adult population in five key areas of the country, Robert. That's not about unskilled labour. It's not exactly about it but it's about the fact that unskilled labor is paid so low these days whereas when i started working because i'm also in that bracket of a uh, 35 year old um that is the poorest genera uh, poorest generation from ever anyway from the previous generation the, the first, for the first uh, time in history you're going to be less well off than your parents generation yes um 
Uh, but just you get paid uh, as little as they can get away with, and when people politicians suggest a national living wage, a proper one, then the stories appear in the same newspapers telling us that businesses can't afford it, and we will put businesses out of we'll put businesses out of business. That's the next message it, we get from the same people that usually blame it on immigration. So on Monday, wage compression is caused by immigration, despite the fact that this is over half of the adult population of our country. And then so you, you, then on Tuesday, when you say, all right, we'll bring in a national living wage, that'll bring the figures up, then we can't afford it. So the wage compression is caused by immigrants, but we can't afford to put the numbers up because, ooh, that would be bad for business. It's insane, Robert. Why do we put up with it? Why do you put up with it? And I apologize if that's an offensive question. Well, why I put up with it, because I have no choice. Um, I can only go back from when I was 18 that I started on an, as an agency as my first job, 16 even. Um, I started on as my first job as an agency at £12 an hour, and then uh, those agencies... Same here. Today, you, it's about what I got you, when I started as an agency. I mean, when I started, and then now you're getting eight, seven, minimum, what's the minimum wage now, seven and a bit? <sighs> Just under eight, 23 after 10. Joe is in Cheshire. Joe, can I ask you a personal question? You may. How am I, how am I, how, what are you hearing today? How am I sounding to you? Am I sounding like an idiot? Am I sounding like a naive fool? Am I sounding like a lefty idealist? Or am I just sounding like you, a, a, a shocked, a shocked citizen? I am really proud of you today oh, all right. for bringing this up because it is a massive uh, thing that you've just realised and you're able to spell it out on the radio. 16 and invite you million, to contribute. Joe. 16 million. Well, I'm lucky today because I've got a hundred pounds in the bank. But it's there's sixteen million people would be, be from a whole cross section, yes. and there are millions of us out here living on subsistence. Basically, you never have enough coming in to cover what's expected to go out. And you know, back back sort of thirty years ago, you had have a company where people are on decent money. And there were 500 jobs. Well, now the government, because it likes to boost its own jobs figures, would prefer that they then employ 500 people on a quarter of the money. And, and you're right in what you're saying. How have we allowed it to happen? The country, like all the inve foreign investment in all of our infrastructures, it's, it's insane. It's like money is king for those that can make the money and the rest of us are just scratching along. And, and why do you, I mean, because my problem is, is, uh, is empathy, actually, for one. So it's yeah. usually the last of my problems. I've normally got it coming out of my ears. But, but on this one, yeah. I don't, I'd just be too tired to get cross, wouldn't I, if I was living like this? I'd just be too tired. I'm too worried. Like the last fellow saying, he's got a couple of days when his house isn't insured because he's waiting for his wages to come in. This isn't people, all those myths about, you know, the people who talked about flat screen televisions and everyone spending yeah, their money on fags absolutely. and booze. That's how it's happened, isn't it? That's how it's happened. Well, Another example, I've, I've just been thinking about it while I was waiting, is there's an in, it's an incredibly draconian world out there just to get from A to B and function. Like, um, you have six bills coming in. And if you complain you, about it, you're a communist. That, that's well, it. You have, well, you have to juggle them. Like, you get, like, me, for example, I currently have got a whacking great big bill that I've got to pay to good old um, City of London mayors. Yes. Because I drove through the congestion charge area, didn't know about how you go about paying it. You don't get a reminder, you suddenly get a draconian right. Now you owe £120 instead of 11 And what, what I mean, um, the impact that, that that figure has on your finances is, 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 is immense, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's, you're going over £100 for draconian measures that then, okay, that's my, A, it's not just my £100 that I was lucky enough to have in the bank yesterday, but it's also another lump off my car insurance that I have to pay next and then, month. And all of these things that, that, that people who are financially comfortable look upon as annoyances and inconveniences actually become sort of existential threats to people with less than £100 in the bank. 26 minutes after 10. Phones have gone bonkers, but I will speak to as many people as I can. I'm not going to rush anybody, though, because this is... This is, this is personal, and this is desperately serious. And listen, you know why it's happening. It, it penny dropped, didn't it, during the last call? Because before it was mug off a Muslim, it was attack the poor. Do you remember? And you could hear it on this radio station. Fat screen televisions, they've got too many cigarettes, they're spending it all on this, food banks are a lifestyle choice. You've got Conservative MPs lining up to say stuff like that. No one's going to put their hand up and say, I'm being absolutely skinned, James. I'm being absolutely screwed. Because then you become part of that army of the feckless work shy layabouts. I'm not a feckless work shy layabout. You must 
prosper. You've got less than £100 in the bank. Get a better job. Who silenced you? Half of the country been utterly silenced through shame. Well, don't be shame today. Emily's in Reading. Emily, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, um, this is a, a subject that was um, definitely brought home to me yesterday. Um, I volunteered at a food bank yesterday in um, North Paddington. Oh, yes. And the woman who runs that said to us, you are never more than three steps away from being someone who would come to us in desperate times. And it's so true. I'm, I fall in the category of um, being the the person born in the 80s not having much more than £100 saving. And to me, that means if anything happened, I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage next month. And it's that kind of literally gone from having a little bit to having absolutely nothing uh, that hits people. And, and, and when you yeah. use the word mortgage, some people, myself perhaps included in the past, would go, oh, you're not really poor. What are you talking about? Oh. You've got a mortgage. You're buying a house. You're not really poor. But A, it, it probably costs less to pay a mortgage if you're lucky enough to have raised a deposit and got on the ladder in time now than it does to pay rent in your part of town. And B, oh. <laughs> you, you can't pay your mortgage. Where do you, where do you go? Oh, absolutely. Um, we were we were outpriced for renting in Reading last year. You, uh, we just could not afford to rent, and um, we were at one point in a, a studio, so you know, an all in one room, paying an absolute extortionate. And we were really lucky. My partner and I, and um, his grandparents, he inherited a bit of money, so that's how we managed to get on the property ladder. And we both have good jobs, but the. The idea that, you know, if I, I had a big bill or something happened and I had to spend all of those savings, I couldn't get the train to work because I, that's my own mode of transport. And, you know, it, it would literally be three steps away. And it was so sort of humbling Stark. to it is. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in theory, I've always been aware of that. And, I, I, you know, I've always had that knowledge and that, that, that figure of speech. But in practice, to be there at the food bank, to see it in front of you must have been... Oh. Quite arresting. Are you are you surprised? I mean, you're not surprised by the phenomenon of this figure, the one hundred pounds figure. Are you surprised by the sixteen million figure that has been extrapolated from the research? Not at all. Really? Um, I think. Um, so I'm sounding like a fool really? to you today, am I? I'm sounding. I'm, I'm sounding <laughs> no. like a head in the cloud, champagne no, socialist. No. Not at all. Um, I, I think I'm in. I mean, all of my friends, we're in our sort of early thirties, late twenties, and and we're all financially in the same situation. So it's not a massive shock at all. Um, I just what surprised me yesterday was the amount of people and how many food banks have come up in the last three years. And actually, why is no one talking about this? It's sort of. No, oh, you know why. You know why. Be because now, yeah. because the people attending them have been maligned and libelled by the media. But I can't say the media, by elements of the media. If you go into a food bank, you're a failure. That's why. You're not going to talk about failures. Why would we talk about failures? You're not going to put failures on the front page. I know not everybody who's got less than £100 in the bank is going to be visiting food banks. But my goodness me, they're going to be a hell of a lot closer, aren't they, than uh, <laughs> well, people with more than £100 in the bank. Uh, Emily, thank you. And here's one from Jason. It goes, she's got a bloody mortgage. Stop moaning. Uh, it may, it's almost as if you've got potatoes in your ears. You, we, we had that conversation. We addressed it. But you're so brainwashed, Jason, into this notion that everybody else is a problem. Everybody else with a complaint is invalid. You sit there watching your children's future circle the plug hole, and you moan at someone for saying, I haven't got enough money. Uh, I've got a mortgage. But that actually costs less than it would to rent the same property. And the only reason I've got a mortgage is because my partner buried his grandparents. And you think, well, there's an opportunity to be cruel. You've got to wake up, Jason. It's your children next. It's 10.31. There's something on the horizon, thought-wise, uh, and it's not clear to me yet. But it's, 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 it's something to do with the way that poverty is perceived. And, and you know when you get the research published saying that X percentage of people in this country live in poverty and the right-wing journalists pile in and say, oh, no, they don't. Real poverty's in Ethiopia and stuff like that. That's part of the problem. But the other part of the problem is the journalists like me who fight against that and almost mythologize poverty. I think I get a little bit of this from Corbyn sometimes. A, a lot of you are saying... Um, Cor this is exactly why Corbyn has so much appeal. And I think you're right. I think this is part of his appeal. People who feel the scale of this injustice so strongly. But um, it, it's not enough. It's, it's, it's almost Dickensian or Victorian, that attitude. 
that, that notion of caring. And, and I'm pretty sure that when Jeremy Corbyn was criticised for taking £20,000 off Iranian state television, it, 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 he did say it's not an enormous amount of money. So by all means, carry on cheering him, but let's, let's not get carried away. 16 million people have got less than £100 in the bank. Some of them contacting me now are earning tens of thousands, more than you'd expect. But something's happened to the way the world works, particularly in this country. Our wage inflation is beaten into second last place by one other European Union country. So the rate at which our wages have gone up in the last 10 or so years, we come second bottom of that table. Do you know who's bottom? Greece. And why have we allowed it to happen? I think I know. I think it's because when our wages weren't going up and should have been, we consoled ourselves with two things. Number one, property owners consoled themselves with the fact that they were earning more money from their house than they were from their job per year. And number two, we could borrow so easily, so we didn't notice that everything was standing still in our bank account and our wages. So I haven't had a pay rise for five years, but I can go and borrow 120 grand at the drop of a hat. I can get a sofa on higher purchase. I remember hearing people say, you know, life's great. You can, you can rent, you can get a sofa and not have to pay for it for two years. And I thought, yeah, that's a great point. I can. Got our first bunch of furniture after we got married. I remember signing the, the higher purchase agreement in Habitat. Habitat, eh? Champagne socialist. I didn't have the money. I should have sat on the floor. And now I do live a bit like that. But my God, I, I, what is the 1%? I'm, I'm in the 1%. You're talking about the 0.01%, aren't you? Who are really living it, really winning. And then 50%, the 50% who have less than £100 in the bank. Jane's in Clapham. Jo, I'll go to you next, Jane, I promise. Joe's in Bromley. She's been waiting a little longer. Joe, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello, Joe. Um, I'm very nervous because I haven't called before. It's only me, um, and I'm in a great mood. You can tell that, can't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can. I listen to you every day. Um, yeah, it, just to say, really, um, you know, I, there is this real myth that, it, you know, you're surprised this morning that, you know, there's that many people that don't have, you know, even a hundred pounds spare. Um, and for me, I just think that is no surprise because we live in the southeast in a very what is considered to be an affluent part of the southeast. Yes. Um, but because of you know we have two children and we travel costs, we both work. My husband earns a, a very decent wage, really, considering you know I think that most people consider that you have to earn below twenty five grand to be considered. And I'm not. I'm not saying we're poor. That's not what I'm saying. You know, I'm not saying it's poverty, but it, it's a struggle. Life well, what's the struggle. word then? What, what's the word that we use? Because I don't know. I don't know how you're not allowed to have a mortgage, know. according to that texter. We um, don't. Well, we haven't got a mortgage. We we rent, and in the south, we. But you we, might be paying less per month than someone with a mortgage. So that's already a no, meaningless we're not. distinction. We're not. We are definitely not paying less. We okay. are paying far more on our rent oh. than we ever would if we had a mortgage. We don't live... That's what I meant. No, 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 that's what I said. The person with the mortgage yeah. has probably actually got less outgoings on property every month compared to you. So despite the fact that somebody else says, yeah. oh, she's got a mortgage, yeah. she can't be poor, the opposite could be true. Absolutely. It really is. Um, and I don't know, I don't know, this, uh, do you blame, is there, a, are there, do you blame the government? Do you, I don't, I don't, I just, I think I, I was born in the 1970s. I think my parents worked hard. We've always worked hard. And unfortunately, since the recession, we had a, my husband had a successful company and the recession hit and basically remortgaged our house that we did have then to try and keep the people that worked for him in work. Unfortunately, you know, it was, times were so bad that that didn't happen. We lost our house and now we're in a position where we rent. I don't want sympathy from anyone. I don't want, there's almost this... What do you want? What do you want? Because this is why I'm sounding so discombobulated no, no, this I morning. Don't think... Well, because I don't want to come on the radio and start treating you like yeah. little orphan Annie. But, but what do yeah. you want? I, and I don't want that. What I'm saying to you is just, and to lots of people out there, the realisation that when you talk about those people with less than £100 in the bank at the end of the month, everyone assumes that they are those people that, you know, are on 25 grand or less or um no no I'm you're right i mean it can't be if it's over 50 percent of adults in some parts of the country yeah I, I mean and that's the realization i think for that people have got to you know understand that life is you can work you know both of you being in full-time employment i if i could work i you know at the moment i'm looking at christmas jobs night work so that when my kids are in bed you know i'll work 24 hours a day 
to find that money so that my children don't go without. There, there, but I, there's something in the we water. We don't drink, we don't smoke. I we don't, don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't go out. I shop at Lidl's and Aldi's. I pay everything monthly. But there is still nothing left at the end of the month. And I don't blame anyone for that. But it's the re you know, I want people should realise that that's how it is for many millions of people. And it's not, you can't blame immigrants. I don't. Don't well, you, you can. <laughs> I but I, you, I need you. <laughs> I, I don't. No, I, no, I, but you can. People do. I mean, you can't, you can't say it's an impossibility. Everybody queuing up to blame immig immigrants for everything while slowly having their pockets picked. Why should, you, why should you blame? I don't blame anybody who is prepared to work hard and earn money. I don't care where they come from. No, but, but if you were, if you were the people... And they work hard. There are many people who don't work hard and don't work. That's Not nowhere near as many as we think, because that was the first chapter in this process. I think was demonising the, the the unemployed and and then creating in people's minds, as you've just beautifully displayed, entirely incorrectly, but creating in people's minds the idea that if you, you know, if you're struggling to make ends meet, it's because you don't work hard enough, and that's the answer to your question about why it doesn't get the coverage it deserves. They've created the idea that poverty yeah. is self-inflicted, and we need a better word than Absolutely. poverty. Struggling is self-inflicted, and that's where the immigrants come into it because. That's that, again, gives another uh, scapegoat for people who actually propagate this nonsense, this, this rancid rhetoric that, that if you haven't got enough money to get by, it's somehow your fault. If you're really desperate, then you're somehow disgraceful. You, you then factor in the, the foreign element and the xenophobia, and it's a hell of a lot easier to blame somebody over the road who wasn't born here but has got a nicer car than yours than it is to blame the people running Bearings Bank, isn't it? I don't think you should blame anybody. I think well, you've got to blame someone, otherwise we're never going to fix it. Or at least you've got to identify where the problem is coming from. I, I, and the problem is clearly coming from the people who've seen their income go up enormously in the last 10 years. Like just about every FTSE 100 chief executive, most bankers. But don't blame the bankers for the financial collapse. Blame the, blame the firefighters. Where am I going next? Jane's in Clapham. Jane, what would you like to say? Hi. Hello, um... Jane. We're perceived as being extremely wealthy. My other half has an extremely good job. He's quite well known. That's why I'm not giving, um, uh, you okay. know, I don't want our name of course. Um, known. But he's also disabled. Now, oh, with everything that everyone's saying, like static cancer, London's for everybody until you're actually disabled yourself and you actually realize how much more expensive it is to live life yes it's like we rent but trying to find in london somewhere because can't take public transport to to his work because um although some train stations and tube stations or buses you know can make it easy but it's not everywhere where you have the lifts or you have the different things so you kind of to be able to carry on working and this is another big bugbear of mine whenever we go to hospital appointments they are so shocked that my partner um does work it's like almost inferred that he shouldn't yes uh, which is horrendous and I could get onto the NHS system there's drugs that he needs that he can't get on the NHS and so that's literally hundreds of pounds a month that we pay and, out and, and yet the government well, the last government took away disability living allowance from millions of people and 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 somehow it was it was waved through by voters we didn't I mean my other half's disability is to such an extent it didn't get taken away. No, I, 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 I'm you know, delighted so to I, hear that, but you're yeah. still in a hole. Imagine what it would be like if he'd just fallen under the threshold and... But I, what I'm saying, he makes such a difference. I mean, he is called by your station to speak on different things. He makes a lot of difference for a lot of people's lives, yet... He doesn't have £100 in savings. We live in rented accommodation that has to be extremely expensive. Little things like, you ask anybody disabled if they can get into a shower that's over a bath. You know... No, my mum's in that position and, and, and had help swapping the, the bath for the shower, but how long is that sort of thing going to last for? And it's certainly not going to be in place when I'm in my 70s in the way that it has been for her. Jane, I, I have to crack on because I'm late for the travel news and there's so many people waiting, but thank you so much for shining another light into another corner that's usually in the dark. And, and, and how, how, how do we make sense of this? How have we let this happen? 
It's easy. It's really, really easy. 2008, things were just beginning to shift. That financial crisis came in at a time when the Occupy Wall Street movement and the notion of the 1% having too much and the 99% finally being on the march was just beginning to bite. It was just beginning to gain traction. I don't think there's a big switch somewhere where the, uh, where the new world order co uh, instructs the sheeple to start obsessing about something else. But if you were sailing your yacht through the Adriatic at the moment and you've got a couple more in dry dock and you were actually worried that the, the, the workers really were at the gates. My God, you'd shake the hands of all those people who turned immigration into the thing that is at the top of all our agendas, wouldn't you? You would shake, you would shake her and him by the hand. Ab oh, thank you so much. People were beginning to turn on bankers and the rich. And we got all our friends in the media to say, stop bashing the bankers. Oh, you, you hate success, you do. You hate aspiration. And then they filed in under that. After we'd managed to do that, we got them all to say, oh, blooming immigrants coming over here. Oh, that's how it's, that's how it's happened. I'm not cynical enough to think it's happened on purpose, but I'm close. And it is clearly the case that we talk about the wrong things all the time. 16 million adults in this country have less than £100 in the bank. That's over half of the population in significant swathes of the country. In the southeast, where I've plied my trade mostly for the last 12 years, the figure is, is by far the lowest. It's still 30% though. And if you'd asked me, I'd have said 10%. And this isn't people living hand to mouth necessarily. Of course it isn't. It's why so many people have rung in and described circumstances that others might think sound quite comfortable. This is just, and, 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 and a lot of our choices are wrong. A lot of this is because we spend money we haven't got on things we don't need to impress people we don't like. It really is. And we need to change our behaviours. That's the point of this research. I, I, I should have said this sooner, perhaps, that the uh, organisation that's conducted the research is also giving advice on how you can accrue savings, even if you're not earning much. The Money Advice Service has, has undertaken the, uh, uh, the research and, and points out that for some on low incomes, it is a real challenge to save anything, but, but you can save something. And there are some great case studies showing that it's, it's possible to salt some away. And that leads you into the other story that we didn't talk about back in in June about what happens if you get a £500 bill that you can't pay and how that actually on income streams that are quite high to have a spare £500 is rare and and I can't shake the notion that we've all been looking in the wrong direction while well, this has been happening well behind me but in front of you We've all been looking in the wrong direction. There's a Tom Wolfe thing, and I know it sometimes seems a little pretentious to cite literature when you're discussing reality, but my God, that's what literature does. It provides you with the lens through which you can examine reality. The more you read, the more you understand, the more you understand, the more you're supposed to see these things coming. And Tom Wolfe wrote about a fella going for a job, and his car got shunted while he was away by another parker. It got moved into a zone that led to it being towed away. He'd parked it really carefully, but someone had somehow managed just to shunt it three feet to the right, which meant that it got towed. And that ruined his entire existence. That simple thing. His whole life unraveled. I think it's called A Man in Full. He's just one of the characters in it. One of the other characters in it is a sort of Donald Trump type character, oddly enough. But the, but the fellow who's whose plight always stayed with me was that notion, like the earlier caller said, you know, you're three things, three steps away. And because it got shunted and because he had to find the money to get his car back and he needed his car to get the job that he was going to be interviewed to do, which he couldn't do, and you see? And just that happens. And yet, when you turn to your journalists in this country now for help and advice, information and reports, you don't get it. You just get told to go and hate on them, hate on the poor, hate on the immigrants, mug off a Muslim. Every single day. Every single day. It's not even like a kind of thing you reach for now when the, when the cupboard's dry. If you do this for a living, what are you going to do? What are we going to do today to mug off the Muslims or to slag off the immigrants or to shoot down the poor? Every single day you can find the ammunition that you need. Topics like this don't work. These don't bust you any parsnips. I'm not selling tickets for the ghost train. I'm selling tickets for the speak your weight machine. And we all hate the speak your weight machine. I don't know. I don't know what the next chapter is in this conversation. 10.54 is the time. Alice is in Hackney. Alice, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Hello. Um, so I'm in my 30s, and it's only been this year that I've managed to create some savings. Um, and the reason is, is that I've made a big sacrifice. Um, and I'm a nanny, and I chose to... And move into a live-in nanny position so i don't have any 
unexpected bills. I don't own anything. I don't, and I've just been able to pay off my debts. And I, I don't really have much of a life because of all, not much of a free life. But that's the way I finally, at my age, been able to get some savings. And by by, by to, cutting out the overheads of leading a relatively normal adult life, i.e., in your own place, in your own room, you're not. Yeah. You're, it goes with the job. Yeah, so wow. it's almost like being in, in the forces or something. That's what it feels like. Um, it's a big six sacrifice because I'd really like to not be in London and be in the countryside where my brothers and sisters live and things like that. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure how long I can do it for. And now I've accumulated the savings. I think how many years am I willing to sacrifice to get enough for uh, whether that's a deposit on my own place or investment. I'm now thinking that is the answer to really create wealth. And um, anyway, I think the thing is with me is I had opportunities to not be in this position, but I didn't want to sacrifice my soul and my morals for a more high paying job. So, well, then you've exercised a choice that most people listening to this probably feel they didn't have. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't have a family, which, and I, you know, my own family. I don't, um, uh, and so I'm sort of, although I don't think I have, you know, I, I admire people, I'd like my own family and things, um, in that way, I do have more freedom. So, this is very much speaking from position of more of a free choice but uh, in, and the way it's relevant I think is that my job is low paid and I think that as in a low paid job I think the conversation well part of the conversation is you know how can you have savings even when your job isn't that well paid yes. um, and I, I don't know unless you do something like I do and you can do that because you don't have your own kids and, and, uh, yeah you're right and that of course puts you and, and I don't know what, what will they say the next generation of haters the ones who've, who've now had to move on from the Muslims and the immigrants and the poor and they have to start hating on people who are in your sort of situation and they'll say things like well you shouldn't have had children if you couldn't afford them you should have you should have lived in somebody else's spare room while you were changing their children's nappies until you had enough money to make a little and, and it will usually be older people who have absolutely no idea what it's like to be in the position that you're in but because they were born during such a rosy period of uh, economics when they could buy a house on a bus driver's salary they'll think there's something wrong with you yeah, or that you've done well. something wrong or that everybody has to do what you do and make the sacrifices you've described in order simply to, to, to stay afloat, let alone squirrel anything away for a rainy day or, or a future, or a slightly more, a slightly richer future. I do wonder, I do wonder though as well, I know that in the past, I, I think I've observed myself and others in low pay professions spend money maybe on the wrong sort of thing sometimes. I know this is not going to apply to... No, a, no, it's in, you a, have to acknowledge this. People. No, you're absolutely I, right. We, of course we do. And people yes. That would buy, they were on minimum wage of me, and I mean, I would overspend on sort of health products, things like that. So that was my, I, that was the important thing for me. But I would see people spending £300 on their boyfriend's Christmas presents, a video console or something, and I would just be, you know... So we're and it was on credit, and, and it was on credit often, and that, and that, that of course, means that <laughs> paying for it every month, it ends up costing a lot more than £300, and they might well be in the category of people who haven't got £100 left at the end of the... It's not just at the end of the month, this is, this is permanent savings. This, this is your sort of default financial position, and, and, I, and I, I make no beef, you've got no problem with me for reminding us that we spend our money on stuff like that, but that's another element of society that seems to have had us all looking in the wrong direction, which is telling us that we can't be happy and fulfilled unless we've got all this stuff. And I, I'm as, almost as guilty as the next man of this sort of thing. I don't have the automobile gene, but I know the pleasure of driving a nice car compared to the pleasure of, or the lack of pleasure of driving a rickety old rust bucket. I don't care what anybody else on the road thinks about my car, if you see what I mean. And yet, we have been successfully conditioned now to think that that £300 on a games console or that 3000 or that £30,000 on a car that none, we can't really afford, but we've somehow got to do it, otherwise we'll look like losers. Two types of trolls listening today, according to my most astute, astute text of the morning. You, you've obviously had a look in the box. I haven't yet. I'm too busy. Um, two types listening. There's the people who are actually benefiting from all this, who want to cover my mouth. And then there's, then there's the people who are losing from all this, but want to cover their ears because they're happier blaming it all on Muslims and immigrants and feckless work shy layabouts. And you can turn on Channel 5 tonight and probably find proof that you're right. They'll have some poor soul there, dressed up like a Hogarthian heroine who's got 17 children by 14 different men and the audacity to expect to be able to feed them. And that'll be proof that there's no poverty in this country and that anybody who's got financial problems is swinging the lead. And we'll suck it up. 
We all suck up bits of it. All of us. Every single one of us. And it'll be our children next.